So good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of BMI KSA, it's our pleasure to present to you this very unique presentation that will be talking about using agile project management to lead a multidisciplinary research program. And our speaker, Dr. Sandra, will provide a real world example. Dr. Sandra actually is the founder and director of research and consultancy at Agile Research Limited. She is also the founder and the leader of the program called Built Environment and Active Transport School Research Program. She is also a professor at Oakland University of Technology and author of two books, Fast Linking Project Management and Academic Research. Dr. Sandra, personal and professional experience span nine cities across five countries and three continents. During this presentation, uh, I will be hosting you on behalf of BMI KSA. This is Mohammed Shalan, BB Digital Transformation at BMI KSA. And uh, we will need to have, the, in case you have any, any questions or comments during the presentation, please uh, share these presentations, uh, these questions through the, the chat or Q&A, and we will be handing these questions maybe at the end of the uh, presentation. Also with us, Mr. Faiz. Mr. Faiz is part of them. BM training school, and he will be helping and sharing some insights as well. So without further ado, Dr. Sandra, it's to you. Thank you very much. I'll just pass over to Faiz for a little introduction about Project Management School before I start. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. Good evening, everyone, and assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Faiz Rasool, Director of PM Training School. We are collaboration partner with PMI KSA and uh, authorized partner with PMI. Uh, we work closely with Saudi Arabia chapter uh, for bringing international uh, speakers, uh, conducting workshops, and helping their stakeholders to get their professional development. Uh, competency uh, development, capacity development. And we are, uh, I would say, one of the very, very few authorized training partners who offer the whole suite of PMI products, all the way from PMP till PFMP, and Discipline Agile, all the way from Scrum Master to Value Stream Consultant. Uh, we offer most of our uh, certification in English language and also in Arabic language. So uh, that's what we are. And this time we requested Dr. Sandra Mendek to join us and talk about uh, using project management, especially the agile way of working uh, to manage multidisciplinary research projects. Uh, welcome, Sandra. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to join you all today from New Zealand. Uh, and, and I look forward to sharing with you uh, the link between project management and uh, academic research from my own experience. But before I start, it's always a little bit of a challenge to do a webinar and not knowing who is on the other side. So I will have a couple of activities throughout this webinar. And uh, they will include they will involve menti.com. So you can either scan with your mobile um, the QR code included here for the first activity, or you can go on menti.com on your on your phone or on your computer. And I will actually start a presentation right now and uh, activity, first activity for us. Just a moment. And... And so if you go on menti.com and you enter the code indicated here, 59065459, I'd like you to type in what is your profession. Just want to see who do we have in the audience. So if you just type in your profession, one or two words, that would be great. We'll just take a few moments and uh, these will be anonymized responses showing up on the screen.
excellent. It's great to see the diverse audience we got in what we got on this seminar. Awesome. So a lot of managers, project managers, uh, PM leads, project engineers, consultants. Excellent. We'll just give another 10, 15 seconds for everyone who would like to enter the response. Awesome. So that gives me an idea who do we have listening. And now I will ask you to go to the next question. Which sector or industry do you work in? If you work in education or academic sector, please put education or academia. The reason I'm asking that there is a particular part of a presentation, I want to see how many people are in that sector and I may uh, speak a little bit more or a little bit less about that. So government, mining, construction, defense, healthcare, excellent. Awesome, so variety of industries, great. Super, okay, still responses coming in. Okay, awesome, so quite a few people at the government, Saudi Aramco, healthcare, and many other uh, industries. Great. So I hope that's a little bit of a virtual introduction to each other. So I'm going to now get onto my presentation and actually introduce myself and my background. So this is uh, Wellington City, capital of New Zealand, where I live and work now. So if any of you is coming this way, do get in touch. I would be very happy to welcome you to New Zealand and show you around this wonderful city. I'm personally from Croatia. Um, I was uh, I was a teenager when the war started in former Yugoslavia, so ended up being nine, a refugee for nine years and finished both my high school and undergraduate as a refugee in Serbia. And my dream was always to go to North America and have a, get a degree, university degree that would be internationally recognized. So I moved in 2000 to the, uh, Canada and I completed my master's and PhD degree in at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. I really enjoyed Canada, absolutely loved the culture, but it was just too cold for me, for my, Medi for my Mediterranean soul to be there. So after seven years of freezing in Canada, I decided I wanted to go south. So I ended up moving to Stanford University and did my postdoctoral fellowship there. And then to dismay of my parents, one day I told them that I applied for a job in New Zealand. There was a little bit of a silence on the other side of the phone call. And um, my mom asked, but Sandy, that's the furthest point on earth from Croatia. And I said, well, but there is a good thing about it. And she said, well, what is it? And I said, well, wherever I move from New Zealand, I'll be closer to home. Well, 13 years later, I'm still in New Zealand and absolutely loving it. So I originally came to New Zealand to join University of Otago as an academic. At the university, I established BEATS research program that I'm going to sp speak to you about today. Uh, two years ago, I moved to Auckland University of Technology uh, uh, in Auckland, based in Auckland. I opened my own company, Agile Research Limited, which is a, a research consultancy. I joined the PMI, and you will hear a little bit of story about that as a volunteer at the time, two years ago. And I was in the middle of all this, and then the job got advertised for a um, principal advisor for transfer strategy at Wellington City Council. I thought, oh, that's really what I want to do. So that's also what I'm doing now. But more about that a little bit later. So my journey spans nine cities, five countries, three continents, four languages, and many colleagues and friends around the globe. So I'm going to now start a new activity, and I'd actually like at the start of this webinar to hear a little bit about you. What are your expectations of this webinar? So we'll just spend a couple of minutes doing that. Uh, there will be another code that I'm going to give you here in a moment. 
So we'll just stop this presentation. Okay. And so now, if you could go and enter a new code in a moment, if you could enter this code now that's displayed on the top, and if you could just put a brief comment, what attracted you to register for this webinar? And immediately after this will come a second question that will actually ask, what would you like to get out of this webinar? And that will help me shape my presentation uh, this evening for you. So if you could just a brief comment, they will be showing up as uh, free responses. Again, it's a bit easier doing this in person, but we got we got a different way of sharing knowledge and information nowadays. Okay, so project management and research, learn how to apply in attaining your PMP certification, learning, building further project management skill, using agile project management, excellent, collecting uh, professional development units, Excellent. Real time to apply the PMP studies. Excellent. So this will go, this should go down. Yeah. To hear about other project management experiences and how the PMP or knowledge of the project management helps the education sector. That's actually going to be really interesting to hear what those of you who would like to learn more about project management application to engineering sector, how much you get out of this presentation. Excellent, Agile. Those of you who, are, who have uh, um, experience of Agile project management more in IT sector, et cetera, it will be interesting to see uh, what you think about this different way of applying Agile in a little bit, I would say a creative way. Excellent. That's awesome. So I'm just going to go to um, to the next question. And just basically, this may be similar, but if it is any different from what you've just responded on a previous question, um, please share it. So I'd like to see, you know, some of you said you want to learn more about Agile, you want to have a learning, but is there anything specific you would like to get out of this webinar? Okay, so learn about the topic. Maybe the previous question covered it all. Okay, networking, excellent. Yep, great. Learning about using Agile research projects, excellent. Practical tips for applying Agiles who know nothing about, to, to for clients who know nothing about project management. That's actually very relevant to academia. Something new and simple tool. Real life example. Learn to engage with stakeholders. That's learning to engage with stakeholders. I'll talk about that quite a bit. Managing schedule in a research project. Surprises. There will be a few surprises, I promise. <laughs> How important project management are, uh, practices are to bring effectiveness in research. You will actually get a lot of that information during the presentation as well. What is Agile? Uh, that will be interesting to discuss what's Agile in the sphere of a pro research project management. Excellent. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts. That actually is super helpful for me to shape the rest of the presentation. Okay. So um, project management is not taught in academ academia, neither as a part of a training of a future researchers, nor once academics are actually working in the sector, we really don't talk about project management. And I will share with you my own journey. I entered academia as well without knowledge of the project management. And I will share with, your, with you my own journey of how the importance of project management actually was very apparent to me when I started this large research program and how I actually got to where I am today. So what I'm gonna to talk to you today is about this BEATS research program, which stands for Built Environment and Active Transport to School. So this is a multi-sector and interdisciplinary research program that's a partnership between academia, schools, local government, and the wider community. 
This program is running in the city of Dunedin in New Zealand and has been expanded to the entire Otago region of New Zealand. I'll share more details with you shortly. This has been a journey of over 3,000 days and counting, and there are many people involved in that journey from many different walks of life. This is just acknowledging the people that played a key role over the last nine plus years of the BEATS journey, and there are many of them, and they come from around the globe. I'm not gonna give you a typical academic presentation, but just to show you uh, a little bit about the context. So we looked at how young, this program is looking at how young people, high school students travel to school and active transport means they're using their, their walking or cycling or scooting. So they're using their own body power to get from uh, home to school. So there is a lot of literature there showing that how young people travel from point A to point B, in this case to school, is not only decision of the individual, but it also it's influenced by wider cultural factors or social factors, for example, what their parents think or what their peers think or how the school encourages them to travel to school. It's influenced by built environments so urban design, places where they live, how far away they live from school. And it's influenced by a policy. So that can be school related policies or wider transport policies and urban design policies that people may not be aware of. So we use that as a framework to set up our research program. And basically our research was developed to go over, um, to cover all those aspects of that framework. So that's on the top. And then at each level of a framework, we designed who do we wanna, uh, who do we wanna collect the data from and what kind of information we need to address questions related to each level of that framework. So now for each of the levels, for example, for individuals, we said we need to we need to collect data from students. We said we're going to survey them and do a few other things. And we looked at outcome measures. So what do we need to get? What information do we need to get from them to answer the research questions? And so for students, we decided we're going to do the survey. We're going to measure their height and weights. This uh, research had a health component to it. We're going to use accelerometers. That's a device to measure physical activity levels. And we're going to do some focus groups. So we did the same thing for other aspects of the research project when we designed it. And this was May 2013. So it was really ambitious and a large big picture vision kind of exercise. What do we want it to do? And so when we put it together, our research methodology involved adolescents and parents doing online surveys, mapping and some GS analysis of they, how they travel to school safe and unsafe areas some body measurements and some physical activity assessment. And we did also focus groups with our lessons, parents, teachers, and interviews with the school principals. So when I presented this at the seminar, I, the research seminar in my department, I was a young academic, uh, started maybe a couple of years into academia. One of my senior colleagues asked a very good question and said, well, how are you gonna pull that off? and who is going to pay for it. And I remember just smiling and saying, well, I have no idea, but we'll, we'll, I'll be back in a year and I'll tell you where we're at. So this is the journey I embarked on and I'm gonna share it with you today. So the, the, the lesson number one was getting the right people on board. And you will know that from any project management experience that you have had or leadership experience in your life. So I started building a multidisciplinary research team, with, including policymakers from the local government, as well as the relevant academics who had expertise that was different than mine. One of the things, uh, so when we put this initial collaboration together, initial group of people, we spent a couple of uh, different departments or faculties at the University of Otago, where I was based at the time, and several other organizations, including universities from overseas from Canada in this case. But we didn't stop there. This research was supposed to involve the schools and the community. So we actually continued on with establishing links with the community and forming the BEATS advisory board. So this, uh, this is not very common in academia, but I just thought there has to be a way that we engage those individuals. For example, in this case, you can see Mr. Gordon Wilson from the Dunedin Secondary Schools Partnership. So that's a school representative. We needed to have them in the project and we needed to give them a role that's not academic role or research role because they're not researchers, but have them engage with us from day one. This was one of the key aspects of the success of the project in the upcoming years. 
So by the time we put the initial team together and uh, what we wanted to do, not only we addressed all the levels of our framework, this ecological model, but we also had a research program that spanned disciplines of exercise sciences, health, transportation, built environment, and education. Then came the journey of securing funding. So I spent about 15 months writing approximately 15 research grants. Not all of them got funded, but some of them did. And one of the key lessons I learned from that is you really got to follow your vision. And in research field, that means regardless of what research grant agencies think. So on the top here, you can see the different research grants that we actually obtained for our initial pilot project, as well as the main study that was the BEATS-1 study. But what we often don't talk about in, is the grant applications that were not funded, including a million dollar grant. This is one of the largest health research grants in New Zealand for which in 2013, I got the response here. Um, this is screenshot showing that the funding body rated this project on a lowest quintile for everything, lowest quintile for the team, for research impact, for the research methodology. And I, as a new academic, I literally cried. And I thought, wow, you don't like this, but this is such a cool project and we're gonna do it regardless what you think. And that's what we did. So 15 months later, we didn't have a major funding for the entire project, um, but we had much smaller pots of money and we actually covered um, all aspects of the project that we wanted to do and we were able to proceed. So what we did is, so here's another key lesson, is design your project as win-win and run it as win-win. As I mentioned, this was a multidisciplinary research project, but it was also designed to provide service to the government, community, and the schools. There was, organ there was a number of organizations that were involved in a team, but we involved the wider community. So we worked with the local city council who provided us some initial funding, facilities, and feedback on our grant and on our research plan. We engaged with the schools and the partnership of the schools provided the consultation, gave us access to the schools and supported this research. And I will show you in a moment what that resulted in. And we engaged with schools that gave us the access to the students, parents, teachers, computer laboratory space so we can do an online survey and assisted with a project. Well, that would have never happened if it wasn't a two-way street. So the city council was getting response to particular topics that they were interested in, but unable to and didn't have a capacity to uh, obtain those data themselves. Schools were interested in a particular thing, and that is how, how adolescents choose their school and their parents and why they choose a particular school. So we integrated that into our research project. So they were getting something that was of value and meaningful to them. And the schools, we included rewards and gave them individual school reports with their results. So for this work, we were funded by all major health research funding bodies in New Zealand, but again, it was a very limited amount of funding. But we didn't stop there. So now when we put all this thing together, I led much smaller project as an academic before, and I looked at what was in front of me and I thought, oh my, I better learn a little bit about project management here. So I went online and um, there was a, a PEMBOOK course uh, based on PEMBOOK, based on PMI program, offered through Open to Study um, online free courses, a very brief course on project management. And I started that course. And at the same time, I bought a PEMBOOK. I think it was, a, it was edition four at a time. And I read through, th through it and I was just amazed how much useful information was there, knowledge, tools, and processes that I've never heard about, yet I was running projects, obviously on a much smaller scale. So I used that knowledge to actually drive the BEATS research program. So the, we developed the study materials. This is the poster, one page poster, A3 size that we took to the school principals when we talked to them about the study. We didn't have graphic designers or anything on board. So most of it, it was basically me and the research team, which most of them were 20 years old that were helping out with a study and coming up what we think should be done. We developed a website, which ended up being the major tool and used to this day uh, for running our research study and disseminating our findings. And you can still see it if anybody's interested, you can still go and check it out. So we provided information for study participants there. So for schools, teachers, students, and parents, and that allowed us to update the information as necessary and not necessarily waste too much paper and printing. 
We developed information sheet for students. If any of you is in academia, you, this is a typical ethics requirement for an information sheet. And we did that. Our university requires it. We brought it to the first school, to the principal to talk about the study. She threw the, this piece of paper over her shoulder and said, nobody's going to take part. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and they said, well, the, the kids are not going to read this. This is so boring. So we went back and revised the sheet. We spent um, quite a bit of time trying to make it a little bit more appealing. We've gone since um, much further, but this was where we were at the time for the start of a main study. So just adding some color and trying to basically provide the same information in a more appealing way. Then there is research part where we designed a student survey. There was uh, almost 10 academics involved and we spent almost a year looking at the evidence and revising it and consulting with the, with the teachers, with the schools to create a survey for students. And then after that, we spent another nine months working through designing the parental survey. And then that survey was too long, so we had to shorten it to 15, 20 minutes. In all that, we ran the pilot project in 2013. This is the team that ran the first session of a pilot project. We surveyed about 80 students in one session, one hour, and we were absolutely exhausted. And after trying our procedures, we basically revised everything. It's, it's the importance of checking your procedures, something that looks great in theory. And uh, in academia, we often plan all these beautiful research design uh, requirements, projects. And in reality, it's really difficult to pull them off in a, in a real world sometimes. So we use this pilot experience to revise our procedures completely. The next lesson learned was aim high and plan for success. And this is something you would know from a project management, the importance of sponsorship. This is not something we often talk about in academic research. So um, we achieved 100% school recruitment rate. Some of you live in a massive cities of multi-million people. The need is 120,000 uh, population and there is 12 high schools. And high schools are very difficult to get in and work with them. They're so busy schools. They got massive um, uh, other pressures and we actually achieved 100% school recruitment rate. That's unheard of in a health type of research that I've been involved up to that date. So that was essential because we had Gordon Wilson, uh, who was the manager of the Dunedin Secondary Schools Partnership, who was on our team from day one and uh, knowing what we're doing and providing his feedback along the way. And he gave us, he basically opened the door for us to all those schools. Then we started planning the project implementation. Again, this the key lesson here is integrating project management knowledge, processes, and tools. As mentioned, I studied, did a self-study of a uh, pen book guide at the time. I've learned so many cool things. Um, one of the highlights there was learning what abbreviation KPI stands for. Some of you may wonder about it. I am not a native English speaker. And I heard that abbreviation here and there in the conversations or seminars I attended, but nobody spelled it out. And it was in pen book in 2013, after working in academia successfully, for five years that I actually figured out what that abbreviation mean. I thought, oh, that's, that's important. Um, another key thing I learned about there that I've never seen before was a work breakdown structure. And I immediately integrated that in our research. So I will show you here. So I developed this first initial work breakdown structure for a school participation of beat study. There were so many moving uh, pieces that needed to be done. And this was actually used as a big picture introduction for anybody who joined our research team as a research staff to help them understand the big picture and show them where their work fits in in the big picture. So this is how our uh, laboratory research laboratory wall looked like in 2014 when we did a data collection in nine schools and we were basically had work breakdown structures for all of those schools uh, for participating in our research. The next step was planning and refining study procedures. Again, something that I got out of uh, studying the PEM book uh, was we needed, a, we needed a document that shows us the standard operating procedures. So we designed the BEATS research team manual and we updated it a year later after we completed the first project. And we used that since in all projects uh, run by our research team. There was a lot of research training uh, of the students, volunteers, and preparing for data collection. These are some of the pictures showing you a lot of fun that we've had along the way. 
data collection in school was an, a unique experience of a project implementation and was very different in every school. And we learned so much through that experience. And we were able to carry the lessons learned into the upcoming, um, uh, the, the following schools that we were working on. Uh, there was a lot of traveling involved around the city. These are some of the trips that I felt like a high school teacher taking the whole class on a, on a journey to just do some of these data collections. And it was a lot of fun. And another thing that as an academic, I've never actually paid much attention to you usually get a research project funding and that's enough to collect the data but um, I've actually started learning from PEMBOK I thought gosh we've got to monitor this budget and how are we doing uh, against our KPIs so this is just showing you for a bit student survey in red shows the funding spent and in green shows the actual achieved objectives of a number of students surveyed. And we, this was the end of data collection. We still had a data processing to do, but you can see that with three quarters of funding, we almost doubled what we planned to achieve for this project, which was fantastic. And actually it would never have happened if it wasn't for a project management tools, knowledge and processes. Another lesson is keep the team together and collaborate uh, and celebrate milestones along the way. So this is the soft skills. This is about uh, praising the team. And this is about um, basically learning from each other and learning together and from each other. So we had our regular research team meetings, regular progress reports for the stakeholders and schools. And I'll show you a little bit more about that and the community involvement and support. So what I've shared with you, so another lesson is basically deliver on your promises. And what I've shared with you over the last 15 minutes was actually a journey of five years from a vision and design of a research project to establishing collaboration, securing funding, developing the research materials and planning the project, refining it, doing the pilot work and doing the actual data collection. Um, in the upcoming years with, oops, with, um, a moment, just a moment, should be what? Okay, let me just check. All good. Okay, so, um, the, the, another key lesson learned was keeping stakeholders informed about the progress. In research, we usually just need to develop, deliver the final um, reports at the end of the research project, but I thought that's not gonna be really good. And it's not enough for our stakeholders in the government and schools. They cannot wait for two, three years until we publish academic research findings. So I started writing these regular progress reports and sending them as a researcher directly to the funding bodies, even though they, were, they weren't required, as well as our stakeholders. And they're all available on our study website. There is more of them that came up since. So now the next lesson was embrace new opportunities and or create them. So we did our original study in the city of Dunedin. So we had urban sample of adolescents. And we thought, well, how about if we move on into rural areas? And so we started this Beats Rural study in 2018 and to provide us the data for urban versus rural comparisons. So this was a completely different project management experience. We had 15 uh, days of data collection in a rural Otago region. So that involved traveling and completely different set of preparations for the data collection. Every school visit was a unique experience. Um, some of those schools were, were very small, others were large. Some of them had 38 students, others had 1,000. We had 17 research staff working on this and over 750 hours of a research, per, per, research person hours just for data collection at schools. We've traveled more than twice the length of New Zealand to collect these research data, even though this was the region that was the closest to where we were based, where our university was based. Over 350 hours of unpaid research staff travel time because we simply didn't have the funding for it. Research funding usually doesn't fund that component. Any of you in project management would know about thousands of emails and phone calls that are required to pull something like that off. And there was this spectacular New Zealand scenery all along the way. 
We had many unforgettable memories, such a wonderful opportunity for team building activities and such a wonderful opportunity to make friendships for the rest of our lives, both with the students as well as the students and research staff among themselves. And I tracked the budget. Now that I learned about project management, I tracked the budget. And this is the first time that I've actually seen what the data collection cost was per student. And this is just to participate in our research was about 75 New Zealand dollars, which actually helped inform my up upcoming grant applications. And it shows us that based on what how many students we were serving, that cost actually ranged from $57 per student to $112 per student uh, in individual schools. So that was first time that I've actually had a better insight as a researcher, how much something like that can cost. So by the time we finished that data collection, we surveyed adolescents from 13, uh, sorry, from 23 schools in the entire Otago region. And uh, we had 85% school recruitment rate and a total sample of research participants was over two, uh, two and a half thousand. I've checked with the New Zealand Ministry of Transport to try to see whether we have representative sample size. And they told me that our research team was holding more data on that region of New Zealand for, uh, for transport to school than they held nationally for the last 10 years. So I thought, okay, that's pretty good. We'll take it as a representative sample. So now extend the vision and the team. So we had completed a study in urban area. We completed the rural study. We had urban rural comparisons. And we just thought, let's look more into cultural aspects. So what Maori and Pacific adolescents of particular ethnic groups think about active transport to school. But then we really got a proper funding for what is called the BEATS natural experiment and or we call it a BEATS 2 study. So this was the study that when we started the original beat study, we knew that the government was building a number of cycle routes throughout the city of Dunedin. And this is actually planned cycle routes are here in red indicated. And we designed the study that we go back into schools and complete what we've done originally for a beats one study that we actually go do it again. And we compare those schools that had infrastructure built for cycling and uh, walking around the schools and those that didn't. So we had actually these exposure areas versus control areas. So as researchers, we didn't decide where the infrastructure goes, but it was still an experiment. So this is what's called a natural experiment. And it's a gold standard uh, research design for examining the built environment changes and the effects on travel behavior. So the lessons from the, this is now continuing our work. This is where that agile aspect comes in, iterative and incremental rep repetition of what we're doing and basically uh, expanding our reach and expanding our impact with research. So always welcoming and finding ways to keep the great people on the team. This just gives you a little bit of an, an idea of the multidisciplinary expertise that we had on the team. And then on a the side were our advisory boards from the schools, local council, as well as other academics and other community representatives that were relevant to our work. When we originally applied for this BEATS2 study to the funding body put expression of interest, they saw 10 people on a team and they said, oh, you have too many people on a team. Why, why do you need all these people? And I've created this graph for them to show them the expertise of each of the individuals and their roles and responsibilities on a, on a, on a team as part of our full applications. After, the, after that, we got a feedback. Wow, that's amazing what kind of team you got. Again, how do we communicate what we need um, is, is really essential whether we get the funding for our endeavors or not. So I just want to also show you, any of you involved in a long-term projects or programs or organizations, you would know that there's a lot of changes along the way. And so uh, this graph just shows you the how the over time there was a change in investigators and their roles. Some people joined the slate, some people initially joined and then stopped and moved on. Other people changed roles. This is our advisory board. We had a lot of changes on advisory board throughout the study, but we did have a key people that kept through and supporting us for the basically nine plus years now. And we had a growing number of collaborators. So I'm just showing you where we are now. So this is not necessarily how we started. So this is our team for 2022. You can see the core investigators on the top, uh, collaborators, advisory board members. We got a study coordinator, some research students and research assistants. 
Another key lesson is giving back and delivering value. So we really focused on a comprehensive and timely dissemination of research findings. Um, this work so far has pub we published 34 scientific journal articles out of it. There is a number of more written and in review. We presented over 150 conference abstracts, published uh, 47 technical reports, and that includes the progress reports for stakeholders, number of presentations, but not only for academia, but also for schools, policymakers, and professionals, so a variety of stakeholders. We organized symposia, I'm gonna show you about that in a moment, and we had a multiple media reports on this work. So really important, giving back and delivering value to the local community. The next lesson was extending the vision and a team. And I'm not gonna go into the details here, but this, this research project actually spanned into other research projects that specifically looked at how we train young people to ride a bicycle. Uh, it had these beat symposia that I mentioned. I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, we organized also international symposia and led to development of policy recommendations for active transport in New Zealand. And we had some other designs of a creative research projects like the Catalyst project, which unfortunately hasn't been funded yet. So this is our symposium coming up for the community. So we organized these in, in the city of Dunedin. Uh, they're all free and uh, we've done them every two years since we started the project. And if any of you is keen to join us or see what it is, there is a, um, there is a QR code there that will take you directly to the registration. And you're welcome to, to see, to join and see how a research team and actually the impact of a research team in action. So uh, I know this is not a relevant expertise, a uh, relevant topic for many of you, but I just thought I'd put it all out, out there. We organized these international symposia, as I mentioned, where we brought people from around the globe to join us for the conversations about active living and environment. This was our uh, second symposium while I was still at the University of Otago. And as a result of that symposium, we developed uh, the report that's called Turning the Tide from Cars to Active Transport. It was a multidisciplinary and multi-sector endeavor to provide the key recommendations for uh, promoting active transport to school, active transport in general in New Zealand. This research had, um, we disseminated research to multiple organizations and this research had a wide impact across New Zealand and uh, our work has been recognized internationally as well. Uh, the, the, again, the most important thing along the way is to keep your stakeholders informed about the progress. This is our latest report that was now two years old. We'll be, I'll be writing a new one shortly. So if anybody is um, keen to look up how that looks like, and uh, that's basically a report prepared with a lot of infographics, you, you can check it out on a bit so study website. Now, a little bit more of project management. Um, something that's rarely done in academic research is actually I set up more systems for monitoring and evaluating progress of the entire research program. So starting four years ago, we created um, a document, Google Doc, for just tracking our progress and writing scientific papers. That's a tough one because in academia, there is often uh, research takes the kind of back seat when it comes to teaching and service and other, other activities that have deadlines. So it was a little bit hard for the team to get onto the accountability train when it comes to delivering the outputs from our research project, but we've done it and we're still doing it. And I'll show you, you've seen results already. As a principal investigator, I also created this research outputs database. Uh, basically, I wanted to have a quantitative monitoring of the research outputs against specific projects, program component, project components, and funding. And I'll show you some of that in a moment. And um, I've also developed a strategic program assessment. So I mapped the research outputs by project components to identify gaps and opportunities, and also looking into the big picture. So here is an example of uh, one analysis, which looks on a top column here. Uh, you can see in the different columns, you can see BEATS 1, that's our original project, then the rural study, then the BEATS 2. And you can see different components of the research. This is specifically related to students and a student survey. And the numbers here indicate the published scientific article reporting the results from a particular aspect of the student survey. The N 
in uh, number in blue that's that was the new manuscripts new research articles that were planned or in writing and then you can identify you can see here in orange some areas where we actually haven't published anything and other areas where we actually published some in yellow but we could do more so this was really helpful for our teams tracking and seeing where are we at and what we could focus on uh, given the complexity of this project, I actually designed this, this is only a part of the infographics that shows the different things that we looked at through our research with numbers here in white indicating the published scientific articles that reported the particular aspects and uh, the ones in uh, red font indicate the particles that we were working on or planning to work on to basically fill the knowledge gap from the information we collected. And Another lesson was established in terms of engagement. So we don't often talk about governance in research projects, but with this particular research program, over time, it became really important to look into governance aspects. So this is our team structure. I'm the principal investigator. We have advisory board on our side, and uh, we have associate or investigators, uh, research students. They often are supervisors of some of the research students. We have research staff and we have collaborators and we got some volunteers that are helping us with the research data collection. The other aspects we introduced was the authorship guidelines. It was very apparent with um, uh, working with people from multiple disciplines that people had a very different ideas who should be the author on a scientific articles arising from research. So we developed our own guidelines and we updated them a couple of years later when the team expanded and we expanded what we're doing as a, as a research group. And more recently, we established the guardianship, data guardianship panel. So this is now the group that actually looks over all BEATS data. So if anybody would like to use any particular data for their research, they need to complete an application. And uh, that, that proposal for use of the data needs to be approved by the guardianship panel. So this was quite novel for the for the academic setting. So this is a summary and overview of what I've actually just shown you, uh, a massive amount of work over the last nine plus years, a lot of research outputs, lots of spin-off projects, lots of projects that have been completed and are on the go. And in 2019, we won the award for the best research team at the University of Otago for this work. So the lesson is you gotta keep up the great work and celebrate the achievements along the way. We plan for the future. We had, uh, because the team is located internationally and we don't have a funding to put everybody together or travel them, move, well, um, have them travel to New Zealand. Our international collaborators were on multiple occasions paying or finding their own funding to come and join us in New Zealand. And we had this uh, Beats First Team Strategic Planning Day in February 2020. Some of you would recognize that was basically about a month before the outbreak of COVID pandemic, and we weren't aware of that. So we looked at the uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and we basically wanted to learn from the past, cherish the pre present, and embrace the future. And then came year 2020. So I'm looking here at a time, I have a little activity for you, but I think we're going to skip that. I actually wanted to ask you to reflect on your own experience on the lessons learned you learned about project management through COVID-19 pandemic. But um, I will actually skip that for the to make sure we have a little bit more time at the end of the session for questions. But I will show you how COVID impacted our work and my own work professionally. So one of the key lessons that I've learned through that was to remain adaptable. When the year 2020 rolled in, we just started the Beats to Study data collection. Literally, we were two weeks into it, and we had 70% of our data collection scheduled to happen in the following three months. We had to stop because students were no longer going to schools. We had a countrywide lockdown uh, for six weeks. And the school said, look, there is so much uncertainty and we just need to postpone that data collection for a full year. 
the whole project came into um, potentially could have been stopped. We didn't know if it's going to be continuing. So I've actually sat down and reflected on lessons learned and wrote the book for the research team that's called Connecting People, Disciplines and World, Worlds, the story of the BITS research program and the Active Living Laboratory, which are then at the University of Otago. And this will never be published. This is many pictures and many memories. And it's actually the story of, the, of our journey. I moved on from the University of Otago to Oakland University of Technology and accepted a junk professorship position there. My family moved to Wellington, the capital of New Zealand, and I joined PMI as a member and as a volunteer for the local New Zealand chapter. We on a BEATS team had to learn to adapt to a new normal. Our meetings were already running online for previous seven years because we had teams from around, team around the globe but I was no longer located in a place where the data collection was happening and when the research assistants were based. So basically I all of a sudden became the person that's running a truly virtual team. The BEATS data collection over the next two years was stopped and started several times all due to COVID. And literally after five goals, we managed to complete data collection two years later, which is still an amazing achievement, but influence of external factors. The year 2021 was really for me a transformational year professionally, so I had to consider the future, adapt, respond, and create a new vision to expand the reach and impact. So I opened my own company with Agile Research Limited and uh, to provide consulting on research and evaluation, project management, and research training services. And one of the things I wanted to do from, from this company is actually introduce the project management into academia. So year 2021, I was adjunct professor at Oakland University of Technology. Uh, BEATS 2 study resumed now through the Oakland University of Technology. I was still a research affiliate at the University of Otago. I started studying from my PMP exam. I was running my own company. I published my first book. And at the same time came the role of principal advisor of transport strategy for Wellington City Council. And I thought, ooh, what am I gonna do now? I had so many, so much stuff on my plate, but I thought this is an opportunity I don't wanna miss. I really wanted to work for the government. And this was a fantastic opportunity to integrate my knowledge and experiences as a researcher. And I accepted it. So now this is the year 2022. I am actually still, doing all of these things. I got my PMP certification earlier this year and I published my second book. So there, it's been a busy, busy year. It wasn't planned, but this is just how the cards have, how the cards turned out on my end. So um, these are the two books that I published. Uh, the, it basically linked with a YouTube channel where you can see some of the short research training courses, but they're basically all linking academic research and project management. And I will show you a little bit of an um, insight in one of the books. This is a more comprehensive book for uh, students who are pursuing master's and, post and PhD degrees. And it has these four different sections. So building and maintaining a strong foundation. That will be basically how to be an excellent research student, how to work with your supervisor, and how to plan your degree. Again, integrating a lot of project management knowledge into this and team building kind of knowledge into academic work. So I've developed these tools uh, plan for planning postgraduate degrees. There are examples for PhD students, masters, and, and what we call honor students, one-year research projects, just to help students start navigating their own journey. Again, a lot of students just start in academia and they don't know where they're going. And uh, it's, um, yeah, so it's just developing some tools. Uh, there was a whole journey of um, uh, the research, uh, basically book takes people on a journey from a literature search to literature review, writing a research method. So basically how the project is done and why it is done a certain way, writing a proposal to try to get a funding or a scholarship to actually do your project and the implementation, planning, implementation and preparation for the data collection and data analysis. Then the research, the project takes, uh, the book takes um, readers through the uh, guiding of how do you write results, discussion and conclusion sections, and how do you put your whole uh, basically research together. 
And final section is about sharing the research findings. So this is how do we write conference abstracts, scientific journal articles, and um, research, uh, doing the research presentations. So I'm looking here at the time. Uh, we're 55 minutes into the seminar. Uh, Faiz and Mohammed, are you okay if I go for another 10 minutes? And then we open the floor for questions? Yes, please do. Please do, yes. Okay, great. So I will show you here, if any of you is interested in seeing this book, I can put this, uh, this uh, slide back up again at the end of the seminar during the question period, if you would like, but I prepared a little sample chapter. If any of you would like to have a look and download it, it's, it's available for you. The access code is listed there. So just to show you, this is not a typical academic book. I really try to integrate uh, my knowledge of teaching uh, research students. I supervised over 40 research students and also um, integrate the knowledge of project management and academic research. So these are some of the infographics that actually lead students or readers through a particular sections. How do we do certain aspects of research? But again, it, it, is, it is project management part because it doesn't matter which research um, topic you are or which sector you are. The book is written for basically anybody who is going through the research process. So it is about the research process. Um, this is, for example, just showing you some slides. How do we put a research report together? What is the usual structure? This is for preparing research presentations, talking about different things that are important to consider when you're planning and designing research presentations. And this is uh, an example of um, infographics of putting together information for writing a scientific journal article based on somebody's research report. So this book has a lot of examples, activities, ask your supervisor sections. It has feedback templates. I'll show you a little bit about that. And it has a number of tips for uh, navigating different aspects of the research journey and some suggested readings. So this is... Um, some of you, this may be relevant. So tips for preparing effective research presentations. They're nothing, um, they're just putting all the information that students would learn along the way and through experience in one place that they can refer to and use it as a guide and come back to it throughout their research journey. This is an example of how do we present a same information to different audiences. So the first one is scientific conference abstract. The second one is showing if we present the same research to academics in a research seminar. The next one is how do we go for a research presentation for stakeholders, professionals, and practitioners? And how does that differ if we are preparing a talk for the general public? So again, this is all of these slides are actually presenting the same research findings to different audiences. I've, uh, whenever I could, I created some tools that I used with my students and uh, included them in the book. So there are a number of activities that the students can do as they're using the book. And these are the feedback templates that I just wanted to show you. So these are, again, the tools for evaluating somebody's work and uh, basically for different aspects of a research, a research and looking at that students can provide, use that for a self-assessment supervisors can use it to provide their own feedback and students can also use those templates to prov uh, to seek peer feedback. So I put uh, with my second book, so the first book was published and one of my professors from Stanford University said, that's great, but that's 153 pages. That's a lot to read. Can you do a, a simpler version? So this is where the book for a uh, guide for beginners came up. And so I published that earlier this year. And with that book, I've also created this set of uh, 12 short research training videos. They're five to seven minutes about different aspects of the research process. And they're available on Agile Research YouTube channel. And you're welcome to check them out. So one of the key lessons here was you got to have fun along the way. Uh, research and any kind of project endeavor is a lot of hard work, but we really made sure that we had a lot of fun along the way and we celebrated those moments and any achieved milestones um, throughout this journey. So I'll, to finish off, I'll just show you this. So I developed this Beats Principal Investigators Happiness Index. So this is showing you the journey of the nine plus years of the beats so far. 
there was many, many happy moments and many reasons to celebrate. And this is what we often hear about when we listen to presentations like this and somebody talks about their work. But in reality, it's also really important to acknowledge there has been a number of disappointments and often uh, some of those biggest disappointments were actually at the same time as we had the biggest successes on our research team. So these are the things we often don't talk about, but we shouldn't forget that any, any successful journey is often has a lot of price paid along the way. We still got a year to go on the BITS research program. And as a principal investigator, I'm certainly hoping for a smooth journey. So the final lesson that I want to share with you is your dreams won't work unless you do. We did complete the BEATS2 data collection successfully in June this year. We again got 100% school recruitment rate and over 1,800 adolescents surveyed. So that's the same as in the original study. And uh, I'm in the process of writing my third book on Compass Guide, which is actually about how to plan and manage a research project. So it's much more linked, uh, further linking of academic research and project management. So I'd like to um, invite you, I'll put a little uh, code out, another Menti activity. I'd really like to hear from you what insights did you get from this webinar? And then um, you can put those comments. I'll just start the presentation and give you the code. And then uh, after that, we'll be to provide any feedback you would like to provide on this. So I'll just go back to menti.com in a moment. Okay. So here is the code for you, a new one. And if you could share here with the rest of the group, what is one insight that you will take away from this webinar? That will be super helpful. And uh, after that, I will, uh, as you enter the comments, I will actually switch to the next slide where you can provide the feedback, which that will be just sitting in the back uh, as we go through the question period. So I'll just give you one minute here, and then I'm gonna have a last few slides and we'll open the floor for questions. Just wanna make sure everybody got a code before we move on. Not sure, they are having learned a lot, a lot of things. So that's why they are thinking what, what, what they need to express, how to express their uh, activities or their understandings. Yes, yes. Great, so I'll leave that. So gain commitment from team members, that was essential. And one thing that's really different in research that many of these people were volunteers or students. They weren't full-time employed people paid for doing this. So it was a whole other level of a leadership that's required for running a project like that. Um, so agile project management, real world example. And as I say, it's a really creative way of using the agile project management. And actually, I, I actually didn't know about agile project management when I started the project. It was just conceptually thinking, gosh, we can't wait to complete one project and give feedback back to the community and the stakeholders two years later. So it's like, we actually need to do something quicker. So we made sure that there was little wheels within the big wheel of the project that we could deliver on quicker. Um, don't give up on your passion and do whatever it takes to move forward. There is no better thing than doing that. And it's like lots of people ask me, what has driven you through all this um, hardship that we've gone through as a team? It's actually that passion and having a higher, higher purpose kind of goal towards you working on and having the vision for the team. Team building, ex excellent. Uh, combination of research and project management. I really like sharing this story because the, the, it's the, the kind of a little bit of a hard part is that in an, unfortunately in academia, there is no understanding for the need for project management. So it's difficult to actually uh, 
train academics or introduce project management in academia if there is no awareness of that need. So it's actually through this sharing of this research and is actually showing what can be accomplished if you do integrate research into, uh, if you integrate project management into research. I'll just turn over now for the feedback. I'm going to close this particular um, slide, but you can enter your feedback. I'm not going to display this. This is just for me. I'd really appreciate hearing what you thought. And if there is anything, if there is one suggestion you could make how to make this webinar better in future, please do so. And I'll finish off with just showing two more slides, and then we're going to open the floor for questions. So again, I just I was the one presenting this and talking to you, but this is the journey of many people and the contribution of many people along the way and journey of over 3,000 days to date. So I really want to acknowledge all the collaborators, students, uh, volunteers, schools, and everybody who took part in this research journey. So instead of a summary, I thought I would finish up with this. So how do you set up, grow, and lead and manage a research program? You do need a research specific knowledge and passion to start with a vision. And then it's key, building a strong foundation. So getting the right people on board and getting the right people in the right seats. Developing the team projects and processes, and then over time, growing, leading and managing the whole program. And that also works further back loop to developing the team projects and processes. Then you need to monitor and evaluate the program and reflect on the lessons learned and integrate them into your work. And that goes feeds back into the earlier phases as well. The next step is to plan the next steps. And from there, you may extend the vision and the team. And then again, the process continues. So that's that repetitive iterative loop of agile project management and incremental, and or you can create another vision. So for all this, it's essential to be aware of a project and program management knowledge processes and tools, and that needs to be combined with transformational leadership and strategic planning. So this will be the title page or the summary of my book number four. It's going to take about two years to get there, but I, I do plan to write this up one day. So hopefully you can, you can read about it in future as well. So thank you all very much. Uh, forget that insight and feedback. I've already given you the code for that. And these are my contact details. And if you want to hear more about Agile Research work, you can sign up for our newsletter. So thank you all for the opportunity. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandra, for a very, very interesting presentation. And a lot of knowledge have been shared, actually. So I think you will share the presentation with us so that we can share it also with the audiences so that they can review it and go through it. Um, you'll yes, be able to share yes. it. OK, good. Uh, so I will start with questions. I have plenty of questions actually coming over the chat. One of them is uh, in this project, you have learned to secure the fund because starting there was lack in the fund for this project. So how you how the project management tools uh, give you some help and insights how to secure this fund? Yeah, so that's probably the only aspect of project management that's actually taught in academia and that's how to write the research grants and you know there is certain aspects of it how do you put it together but it's very rudimentary so it's so focused on the technical aspects of it this is you need to provide a rationale and you need to write methods etc what their project management was really helpful for me maybe not initial stages until i learned about it was really putting those other aspects like the planning for the budget planning for the timeline and actually tracking our progress um, over time and being able to feed that into our upcoming grant applications. So it's really that whole idea of it's not sufficient to have a rationale for the for the research that we often focus on so heavily on in academia. We're all about looking at the evidence, what others have done and what we should do. But it's also planning what realistically can you pull off Part of the project management that I think was really helpful running that pilot project and actually testing out your procedures and then seeing, oh, time-wise, this doesn't work or this costs too much money or we don't have a staff for this. So it was really uh, reflecting on the feasibility component of a planned research project, which we, again, in academia, we really often plan uh, very big sky thinking. This is the question we want to answer, but it was actually providing the tools of how, do you, how are you going to answer that question in a way that's feasible and that you can pull it off. Yeah, great, actually, yes. 
Uh, one more thing, actually, is um, you said about transformation knowledge and how you employ, how you establish or use the transformation knowledge in this project. This is very interesting yeah. topic. Can you shed more light on this? Yes, absolutely. So I think one of the key things was that co-design. So we call it a participatory research. So it's a co-design. The fact that we involved the local government and the schools from day one into the project. Some of the, I didn't share the exact, find, any of the specific findings, but for example, uh, when we started, there was, it was driven, some of the questions or some of the aspects of the projects were driven by the questions from the community. For example, schools were very interested in a school choice, who chooses the school and why. And so because we co-designed that part of a study with them, by the time we got the findings, they were actually directly applicable to them and they used them in the, to inform the promotions of the schools and their own activities because the, the findings that we provided them were directly applicable to them. And that actually enabled the not only knowledge, um, well, it enabled knowledge integration and research impact. Some other aspects of this work were, for example, um, we had in response to findings from these uh, surveys, again, the surveys were co-designed with schools. We had some schools, for example, introducing pens as part of a, a school uniform for girls so they could actually walk and cycle to school and because that was a major barrier for them. We had another school earlier this year that banned mobile phones from the use in high school because they actually saw from the aspect of our study that the students are spending over five and a half hours on average per day on screen, screen time, mobile phones, computers, TV, outside of school hours. And they use those findings to inform some of their policies. So there are actually a couple of other examples, but it's actually the, the point is if you co-design research with your end users, the findings are going to be applicable to them. They're going to be supporting the work. Findings are going to be applicable, and they can actually use those findings and run with them in their own in their own work. So that's actually the biggest potential for a transformation. And it's not a top-down approach because it was co-designed. Uh, it was actually designed in a way that's informative and useful for them. So I think this transformation get a lot of stakeholders engaged, a lot of people engaged during the journey of the project. Yes, and it's actually from day one. It's that whole idea of a co-design, research co-design, and I've done it for a number of other projects. It's it's amazingly powerful because the, the people have a chance to provide the input to make sure that the findings that the, what research produces is relevant to them and useful to them. Yeah, great, great. Uh, one more thing, maybe it's a strange question, but because most of the people are actually thinking uh, research will start at, at, and knowledge start at academia. Uh, actually, we are volunteers of BMI and we are happy that, to learn from you that there was a lot of research, a lot of activities, a lot of knowledge shared by BMI. So um, how you see this uh, point here? Yeah. Who is starting the, the, the knowledge? Is it academia or uh, um, other institutes? <laughs> Yeah, I think it it should be a partnership. Um, ideally, so I work now for the local government in a transport sector, and I'm designing now the research assessment for the transport for Wellington City. It's super exciting, but it's actually um, that's a part of um, you to do research. You do need to know how to do the research, but academic research is not the only type of research, and there is a lot of research that what we call in academia we call it the gray literature. Government departments do a lot of research. Companies need to to do research, to understand their markets, to understand where their products are going. And so it's actually knowledge of the research process is more important than necessarily academia. And there is a lot of research that's shared and um, not in published academic articles. And so what I found now, for example, working for the local government, I found that a lot of even my publications are not available to the local government and any of these organizations, they need to pay for every single article that I published, they can't just access it. So there is a big almost like Berlin wall built between the 
academic knowledge and the end users. So I think to bridge that, and this is what I'm doing through all my multiple activities, is actually trying to, if you have people like me who sit on both ends, on both sides, I can actually access academic literature through being professor at one of the universities, and I can uh, listen and build the research um, kind of um, capacity and projects by sitting with a local government and knowing what they need. So it's actually, I think the future is about partnerships. Academics are always looking for research projects. They have a hard time getting funding. And uh, it's actually, how about we work together? How about academics actually reach out, get out of, um, I like to call it ivory tower, and get out of your ivory tower, go out with the community, go out in a, in a, a bit, work with the local government, work with the industry. And how about if we bring together the knowledge research knowledge and how to do the research and how to interpret findings and methodologies together with people for whom that will be useful. So I, th I really think the true, the way forward to get a real value is that cross sectoral collaboration and partnerships. Yes, great. And uh, one for our audience is, was trying to find uh, what risks you find in your journey and how you mitigate one of these risks, if you give us one example. Yeah, so that's great. That's one thing we don't talk about in academia at all. All our research is planned. It's going to all work perfectly. And that's where most of these projects fail. We really don't think about risk at all. We just think this is what we're going to do. Everybody is going to come and participate in our research projects. And then we wonder how come we didn't get enough participants and the funding ran out. Um, so I think that's the big one that I gave an example was the COVID. And we weren't aware of that risk. So this was one of those unknown unknowns. Uh, and it came around the corner. Um, so I think um, another big one was always for us the recruitment of participants. So one aspect I didn't talk about was a parental survey. So that was our initial, we wanted to hear what parents think in our original study. It took the most resources and the most time from our research team that we could never even imagine that would happen. It took us three years to collect the data in what something that would have taken a year, and we collected only a third of the data. So I think some of the risks are just those unknown unknowns and also the biggest risk in academic project uh, academic research project is i think the lack of awareness and knowledge of project management so the basically the risk of incomplete and inappropriate or poor planning of a research project without even knowing there is a poor, poor plan um so you know that's i think a lot of those things the specific risks for specific research projects are really sorry risks of project specifics but I think some of those risks related to planning the project and integrating the project management knowledge, that could be significantly reduced by people being aware of what needs to be done. And that's where the project management tools, processes, and knowledge comes in place. Yeah, interesting, interesting, really. Uh, one question is, um, what kind of project management information software have been used in this project? None. Um, so I did <laughs> Yeah, I did sign up for Microsoft Project at the time, which I've learned about it when I took my, when I read about PEMBOOK and uh, did a course. I signed up for it and I literally never opened it. So again, this is something that, and it's still to date, I haven't used any research project management software myself. I am now through the local government, one of our project managers for another project is just said, oh, I'm using Microsoft Project. So I just downloaded it last week on my computer. So I want to check this out. <laughs> Now, 13, 10 years later, uh, none. And this is this is another unfortunate thing in academia is nobody talks about it. Nobody even knows those things exist. So, yeah. Then how, how you manage all this kind of information? Because I think you have plenty of information coming. It's not only the schedule and project management, but also the other uh, data. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's amazing how much that in academia, unfortunately, that's um, uh, by the leader. It's, it's a lot in your head and a lot of, obviously there are a lot of, we design a lot of uh, um, Microsoft Excel documents, et cetera, but I think it's so inappropriate. I, I'm, I'm in a webinar, this is my son. <laughs> just, just, just go, 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 go see daddy. Go. Okay, it's just a moment. Okay, um, sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, 
Yes. Yeah, so basically, a lot of that is, I think, very rudimentary in academia, and there is a plenty, plenty of uh, opportunities to actually bring the project management knowledge into that. Okay. And one thing is uh, about the agile concept. Actually, you get to know the agile concept while you are practicing and doing research. Um, how you benefit from it, and how you see it today? Because we are going now in. The, the project economy, we are going out of transformation projects. So how you see Agile? And is this really, we can apply it solely or we have to have a kind of hybrid approach usually? Yeah, so I think that's very interesting because as I say, like I wasn't aware of Agile when I was doing this and setting it up. It was just like, gosh, what we're doing and that was a waterfall methodology, it just doesn't work. It takes too long and it's just not delivering what it needs to deliver. So when I actually read about Agile project management about five years into the project, I thought, this is it. This is exactly it. This is what needs to be done. And this is what I've been doing. And this is the main reason for a success of the whole thing. And I can give you an example of literally a meeting I had yesterday in a, in a government uh, sector. Uh, we're designing, we're setting up with some new project that's looking into blue sky, thinking about assessing how transport looks like in a particular city. And we're at a, at a starting stage. And we're talking about the indicators that we need to include into this report, dashboard, whatever it's going to be. And I, I just said, well, you know, there may be 10 or 15 indicators. How about we start with one? How about we take one through the whole process and then ask others for a feedback? This is totally typical agile approach, right? And it was so novel to them. And everybody said, wow, what a great idea. <laughs> so I think there is absolutely massive opportunity to just introducing agile on a very basic level in the using the terminology that people would understand for their project without even mentioning it's an agile type of an approach, but it's just learn, teaching people like, can we pick one thing, develop a minimum viable product, get a feedback on it, get it in not only, get it beyond the minimum viable product, get into something that's really good and working, and then get onto another project, another aspect of it. So product or however you wanna call it, component of research, component of a particular project. So I, I think, I really think the agile is our reality. The uh, The world is moving so fast that if we're using the waterfall methodology and we're waiting to complete one project and then go on to another one, we're gonna be left far behind. So we just need to take the smaller pieces, um, have multiple teams running things in parallel, learning from each other and just going through that iterative and uh, incremental cycle. And um, yeah, I mean, that's the future. That That's the reality already now, but that's certainly the way forward. Yeah, exactly, especially with the innovations, with technology that's coming, that's really uh, important. It's, but actually, when we are talking about Agile, we are talking about another side, which is uh, governance, because Agile might get things flowing uh, in nowhere. So how uh, governance affect your project and how you control these kinds of elements when you are managing a project would have a lot of stakeholders, other things. Yeah, so that's that's a very good one. In our example, that's another thing, again, that's very uncommon in academia. And it was actually through our work um, that the governance was established basically about seven, eight years into the program. And it was from my collaborators, as well as from our people from a community, we're talking primarily the school's representative, um, who were saying like, look, we, we got to establish some governance here. And again, that's, that's a type of a, um, project man or that's the component of project management that's literally unspoken in academic research. So I showed you some little things that we've done with the governance and just establishing, for example, now we've been 10 years into the project almost, who has access to the data and how can people get access to the data? Because we, we really want to increase the value of the work that we've done. Uh, that's some things that I, I don't know. I can just share from that one experience. I've been an academic for over 12 years now, 13. I've literally never seen any governance in any other research projects or programs that I've been involved in. So it's, a, it's kind of, um, again, one of those things that's so rudimentary in academia and pretty much often doesn't exist. Maybe in some other sectors, but certainly not in the health and transport sector that I've been involved in. And um, actually, really, I mean, we are grateful for this, a lot of insights in this presentation because it's a kind of journey, big journey for a long time. And I think still you have one year to complete the, the, the journey. So I see that maybe you are asking for some volunteers if someone need to volunteer or something like this, just to share through the code and see how, how do you do things. 
And yeah. what, what will benefits uh, will be, what will be coming out of this volunteering with this project? Yes, yeah, so when we ask for people for volunteers, uh, they actually usually are the students who help out with different aspects of the project and different just for their own learning journeys. Um, what I'm hoping uh, to get out of this, if I can just take it on a full next, and that's part of the symposium coming up, what's next? Um, we've actually been asked, this, this research program has been um, recommended to even the local government and the particular transport uh, initiative here in the Wellington city, that for their own massive transformation project that they're doing or initiative on transport sector, that they need to establish the academic partnership multi-sector partnership based on beats and actually i'm hoping what can get out of this is i'm really hoping to um to be able to share further the power of actually integrating project and program management knowledge processes and principles into academic research and the power how that can improve effectiveness of what people are doing but also a power of uh, that multi-sector collaboration and, as I said, the partnerships. So I'm not sure if I'm exactly answering your question, but I think going forward is really the agile project management type of methodologies for approach to research, the multi-sector partnerships and collaboration, and that co-design that we talked about, co-design. I think I think that will be something I'd like to take out of this project. And my ideas of sharing this seminar and writing my books is actually, that's my personal slash professional intention of, can we spread this knowledge further? And just, and I think often in academia, it's just giving people different ideas, what could be done. It's not necessarily telling them how to do it. There is lots of brain power. There is lots of amazing, amazing people doing fantastic job, but giving them ideas, what can help them to be even more successful in their own journeys. Yes, really, it's very important because it's actually, um, we are collaborating, we are adding value to each other. So it's really very important to collaborate and to share knowledge. This is one of the goals that we have in BMI case eh? and as well in the BMI globally. So I really need to thank you for this very interesting presentation. It's very unique. And uh, I think we will share the presentation with, the audi with our audiences after, you know, after some time, uh, if you share it with us. Uh, and um, so um, thank you really very much. I need to ask you, what's your final comment uh, to your audiences here in Saudi Arabia or uh, people who are listening to us? Um, uh, thank you all for, first of all, for your time. And thank you for the opportunity to share my work um, and experiences. I just say the final comment would be um, look for win-wins and look who you can work with to multiply, so to speak, the benefits of the knowledge you got. And I would say if you are in industry, if you do need to expand your reach, um, think about what are the other sectors that you can collaborate with and learn together and learn from each other. I think my own experience is really stretching yourself beyond the boundaries of your comfort zone and seeking collaborators and seeking to work with people who you know nothing about what they do so you can get a fresh ideas for your own work. So yeah, I just wish you all all the best on your own journey. And uh, if you are coming to New Zealand, do do get in touch. We'd be very happy to welcome you here to this country. And um, if you have any questions or if I can be of any help, make sure you contact me. Yes, uh, maybe you need to hear something from Faiz if you have anything to comment. You can switch your video if you want, uh, Faiz. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. And, uh... As usual, it was a fantastic presentation and we can clearly see how important is project management in managing research projects. Thanks a lot, Mohammed, for organizing the whole event and uh, we will keep on collaborating with PMI KSA. We'll keep on offering more and more interesting seminars, uh, short courses. In fact, there is a short course starting very soon as a part of National Day Gift. It will be free for PMI KSA chapter members, and we are offering it in collaboration with the chapter. And it would be an introduction to lean and agile, and an introduction to discipline agile, a new forte by PMI. So stay tuned. Uh, I think it is starting within a week. You can reach to PMI KSA to know more about it, and you will be getting uh, certificate of completion and four PDUs as well. Thank yes. you. So
Thank you very much. So please share the presentation as well this information so that we can share it to our uh, members in PAC. Yeah, okay. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Most thank you all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.